Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, this is Shackleton. And uh, today I'm going to elaborate on some of my previous videos where I was discussing the uh, Arctic sea ice and when we would have the first uh, blue ocean event, when it would basically um, disappear um, at the end of the melt season. So that would be a September. Um, and there is a, a recent paper, fairly recent paper, that elaborates on the seasonality of the Arctic sea ice. So it focuses not just on September, but what happens when we lose all the Arctic sea ice in September. Um, and many years ago, I discussed uh, some of the curves and showed that as September went to zero, you know, the year of the first blue ocean event, it would probably pull down the surrounding months. Um, so August and October within a few years. Um, and within a decade that the, the entire Arctic Ocean would be, would be ice free. So this guy's always hungry. I maybe should take him to the vet and get that checked out. He's a skinny guy, but he's always eating. Okay, so let's um, talk about um, the recent findings from the paper. Um, so, first of all, uh, let me start over here. So this is this is the previous uh, blog and the previous series of videos um, where I talked about the Arctic sea ice trajectories from the observations and the models. And the key findings from this is that most models predict a ice-free summer, Arctic in summer, less than 1 million square kilometers before 2050. September sea ice is decreasing at the rate of about 2.73 square meters per ton of CO2 emissions, a powerful linear relationship. Um, but this number will vary for each different month. And by 4 million square kilometers per degree Celsius of average global warming. Okay, and I talked about um, the different uh, data and uh, wh where those numbers came from. And but I also talked about so the forcings, the um, anthropogenic forcing from our greenhouse gas emissions, the internal variability, the chaotic uh, component and the natural forcings and how the natural forcings haven't significantly changed, that it's basically us, the deterministic components, and how, you know, for less than two degrees Celsius global warming relative to pre-industrial, the deterministic component or the, the trends go to zero for sea ice. And of course, the chaotic part has a plus or minus one million square kilometer effect on from from year to year so so that's all in the um previous videos so and uh i'll i'll post um the videos in in facebook and also on my uh, twitter account so follow me at paul h beckwith okay so let's get to the paper uh, well first of all yeah if you google arctic sea ice graphs um and then you f select the whipneas po mass graphs this is what the Arctic sea ice is doing. This is the Arctic ice volume in September. So you can see the data is the black line and various fits are shown here. So we've got the exponential fit and that's taking the, the, um, the volume down to zero by 2025 or so. Uh, log fit, similar. And this is a linear fit through all of the data by about 2027 or so. And um, now this is a so-called Gompertz fit and that the sea ice survives a bit longer in September. Um, and this could happen if there's uh, some strong negative feedbacks. And I've talked about some of those feedbacks in the winter, mostly um, with the, um, if it's open water, if we have a massive melt year, a lot of open water, then the open water can, can form ice very, very quickly. And the ice is forming later, so there's no snow or less snow on the ice with, to insulate it, so it grows faster. Um, 
you know, those are the, the, the main types of, of uh, feedbacks in the winter, which have kept the ice around for as long as it has been. Now, if you take all of the other months and you put all the 12 months here, um, this is this curve here, this green curve is the curve that you see here. Okay, the black curve here becomes the green curve here. So this is September. And uh, with the trend line, this is a million uh, ice volume. Uh, well, a million square kilometers, if the ice is a meter thick, um, that's, that's uh, one thousandth of a kilometer. So a million uh, square kilometers would be about a thousand um, cubic kilometers if the ice, ice thickness on average was about a meter, which, you know, first year ice is one to two meters uh, when, it, when it grows. So if it's two meters, uh, you know, and melts down to a meter, you know, that's the sort of number. This is actually not a million square kilometers, this is a thousand cubic kilometers, but, but you can basically see the trend lines here. Um, so when September goes to zero, then next it pulls, um, this is August, and then this next line here is uh, October. And then uh, the next few months get pulled down here. Um, so that's uh, um, July, I guess. And uh, July and November. Okay. And so, and then, so the rates of all of these curves could increase when there's no ice in these months and pull it down even faster. So, you know, that led me to my estimate that after the first blue ocean event, no ice in September for a couple of weeks or the month. And then within a year or two, no ice in the surrounding months, August. Um, so no ice in August, September, October. And then after a few more years, um, add the uh, July and November months down and then so on. Okay, and I'll show how this is discussed in the actual paper. So this is the paper, The Changing State of Arctic Sea Ice Across All Seasons. And I'll bring up this form, which I've marked up. So, uh, so this is by the same authors uh, as the last paper that I discussed, but different order here and different uh, results. Here they focus on all the seasons. Okay, so clearly we're losing Arctic sea ice across all seasons. Okay, now they use satellites, atmospheric reanalysis to get all the climate variables, climate model simulations, and the literature review. Relative to the 1981 to 2010 reference period, the recent anomalies in spring and winter sea ice coverage have been more significant than any observed drop in summer sea ice. So summer sea ice has dropped significantly, but now it's actually look low so that the rate of drop is actually higher now in the spring and winter. So for example, May and November of 2016, the sea ice extent was almost four standard deviations below the reference number in those months. Uh, decadal ice loss in the winter months has accelerated from 2.4% per decade from 1979 to 1999 to 3.4% per decade from 2000 onwards. Um, I also talked about in the previous videos how there's a strong linear relationship between the pan Arctic, so all across the Arctic sea ice and total anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So the sea ice loss per ton of CO2 emissions, so it ranges from about a square meter of ice throughout the winter to more than three square meters throughout the summer. And based on these trends, based on this strong trend, just on CO2 emissions, we find that the Arctic Ocean will become sea ice free throughout August and September for an additional 800 plus or minus 300 gigatons. So that's in the range, that'll bring it be 500 to 1100 gigatons at 500 gigatons divide by 40 per year. That's 12 and a half years to uh, 27 and a half years at 1100 gigatons. And it will be ice free from July to October for an additional 1400 plus or minus 300 gigatons. So, so uh, and that will take longer than a decade, but I think that the nonlinear effects that kick in when we lose the sea ice in the first blue ocean event will pull the other years down quicker to within 
a decade. Okay, so let's have a look at the gist. Well, one thing is that sea ice, we know it exists in the polar regions, right? In the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, throughout the observational record, there's been at least 16 million square kilometers of, that's about 5% of the world's oceans have been covered in sea ice at any one time, right? And the two phases are are out of sync, you know, winter in the northern hem hemisphere, summer is summer in the south, and so on. Um, but at any given time, because of this uh, uh, asynchronicity between the north and south pole, you have about the 16 million square kilometers. But of course, that's changing rapidly. Um, and, uh, you know, in the summer, we've been losing the sea ice at about 14% per decade decline in the summer sea ice extent. But this trend has not been consistent. So in this time series, um, you know, mo most of the, in the second half, so the more recent Septembers, the trend is 3.5 times that of the first half. So the acceleration of the loss of sea ice, you know, this 14% per decade, you know, over three or four decades is highly non-linear so it's you know much much smaller than 14 originally and much much greater in fact 3.5 times greater um, recently and the decline in winter is uh, much weaker about 2 minus 2.4 percent per decade so other things that are happening is the melt season is starting earlier by about three days per decade so that's about by uh, um, 12 days you know over the period of the data, 1979 to present, and ending, and, and the, um, so the melt season starting earlier, and it's ending later by about six days per decade. So the seasonality of the ice cover is changing. Instead of being perennial, like your perennial plants, it's becoming annual, it's, it's becoming like an annual, like annuals for, you know, it'll be you know, the ice will completely disappear in the summers and come back in the winters, but the duration of open water will extend and extend and extend. And it's already happening in some places, like uh, the ice-free season, in, you know, is, has increased 40 days per decade within the Barents Sea, for example. Okay, now, so let's see, uh, you know, how do we get, so this is, uh, extent or area, you know, which we get have good data from satellites, but for ice thickness, it's diff more difficult. We've used upward looking sonars in submarines. This is Peter Wadhams is a lot of his work was from submarines with sonars looking up. Also, you can have sonars on moorings that are looking up and then laser and radar altimeters from satellites and aircrafts. And uh, basically the average thickness has decreased from about 3.6 to 1.1 meters over the period 1975 to 2012. Also, the Arctic sea ice cover is getting much younger, mostly it's first year ice. We've lost almost all of the five year ice, five year old multi year ice. Okay, so this is consistent with the thinning of the ice cover. Younger ice has a, had a shorter period of thermodynamic ice growth. Okay, so it hasn't existed for very long. And there, it doesn't, hasn't had as much time to deform and to ridge up compared to the older ice. Okay, and the forcings are mostly the anthropogenic warming from increased greenhouse gas concentrations. There's also some internal variability that can amplify the loss. And the, um, the natural forcings have not changed that much. Okay, um, now also, uh, you know, there's other fa factors that come into place. Um, there's amplified winter warming of the lower troposphere of the Arctic that's melting the ice. There's more moisture getting up there. There's, there's increased cloud cover. Increased cloud cover in the fall can actually prevent as much heat being lost to space. Um, increased uh, precipitation in the fall. And of course, it's affecting permafrost temperatures and Greenland melt as well. It affects the weather patterns, the jet stream, the ridges. It affects ocean circulation. Um, and it, also, it affects the ice uh, sheet and glacier melt, and that leads to sea, light, sea, uh, sea level rise. Okay, so I'm going to have to continue this in a second video, so thank you for listening.